This educational video is provided to you by the European Respiratory Society. It demonstrates how to perform flexible bronchoscopy. This is a valuable procedure that can be performed in an endoscopy suite and provides us with the ability to examine the airways. It can be used for either diagnostic or therapeutic reasons. The first bronchoscopy ever performed was in 1897 by a German laryngologist named Gustav Killian who used a rigid scope in a conscious patient using topical cocaine as a local anaesthetic in order to remove a pork bone. Later, in the 1920s, Chevalier Jackson inspected the trachea and the main stem bronchi using a rigid scope. The flexible scope was invented later, in 1966, by the Japanese physician Shigeto Ikeda. He was the first to use fibre optic bundles connected to an external light source and thus for the first time visualised lobar and segmental bronchi. The indications of flexible bronchoscopy are based on the ability of the bronchoscope to provide either diagnostic data or a therapeutic intervention. The most important indications are chronic cough, hematosis, unexplained autolectasis or post-obstructive pneumonia, radiological findings such as a mass lesion, diffuse perishable disease, for example sarcoidosis, mediastinal hilolympadenopathy, diagnosis and staging of lung cancer, sample collection for genetic analysis. In specific circumstances, it can be used in the intensive care unit. The contraindications to flexible bronchoscopy are mainly relative rather than absolute. A physician should carefully consider the potential benefit from the procedure, especially in patients with an inability to adequately oxygenate during the procedure. Uncorrected bleeding diffusis or coagulopathy. Hemodynamic instability. Acute myocardial infarction within four to six weeks. Flexible bronchoscopy can be performed in an endoscopy suite or in an operating room. The endoscopic procedure rooms should be large enough to contain the equipment and staff needed to perform a procedure. Each patient should be monitored for vital signs and oxygen saturation and all procedure rooms should have easy access to resuscitation equipment, including boxes for endotracheal intubation and a cardiac defibrillator. Oxygen outlets suction devices, sinks and hand hygiene supplies should be also available in each room. A generally pleasant atmosphere with minimal noise during procedures provides the patient's comfort and relaxation. A dedicated intake and recovery area should also be available where nurses and physicians can receive and prepare patients for the procedures. In order to perform a flexible bronchoscopy, the necessary equipment includes a flexible bronchoscope, a vacuum source and suction tube, monitor equipment for ECG, blood pressure cuff and pulse exometry, supplemental oxygen device, lidocaine 1-2% for topical anaesthesia, Intravenous sedation should be offered. A sterile collection trap. Protective clothing for the staff involved in the procedure. Gloves, a mask, surgical protective cap and protective glasses in order to avoid any contamination with blood or saliva. On the day of the examination, patients should avoid any type of meal for at least 6-8 to eight hours before the procedure. It is preferred that they are accompanied by a friend or family member 
and they advised not to drive or handle any type of heavy equipment for the rest of the day following the procedure. Before undertaking flexible bronchoscopy, an informed consent should be taken from the patient or any other valid authority. Patients need time to read and understand the information provided and should be given the opportunity to ask questions. The physician should explain the possible benefits and potential risks of the procedure. A medium or a large ball vein catheter is inserted and the topical anaesthesia is started. In order to reduce the gag and cough reflex before entering the airway with the flexible scope, proper local anaesthesia and conscious sedation should be provided to the patient. Lidocaine is the most often used drug. It is most effectively provided using gel at 2%. While oropharyngeal topical anaesthesia is best provided using 10% lidocaine spray. Lidocaine is also applied via the bronchoscope working channel in a spray as you go delivery manner with a 1% solution. A good topical anaesthesia can decrease sedation requirements. Before starting the bronchoscopy, all members of the medical team should revisit the case the indications and possible risk factors for the procedure. Short and long-term strategy, sedation parameters and procedural planning should be drawn and be clear for everybody involved. Make sure that the informed consent covers your procedural planning. The patient should lie in an upright position, the head is comfortably set on a pillow. The patient is connected to the monitor in order to follow all vital signs and oxygen saturation throughout the procedure. The bronchoscopist must also be comfortable. Shoulders should be square and relaxed, feet fully on the ground, the elbows tucked in. Care should be taken not to upset the patient and voice should be kept calm and steady allowing the patient to remain relaxed and confident throughout the procedure. Always keep the radiological exams of the patient somewhere close so you can re-evaluate during the procedure if needed. Bronchoscopy can be performed with the physician standing either behind, in front or at the side of the patient. The scope can be inserted through the nostril or the mouth. When entry through one nostril is difficult, do not apply force on the scope, but instead try the other nostril. If it is still difficult to advance the scope, then try going through the mouth. When entering the mouth, use a bite block in order to protect the scope from the patient's teeth. There are particular cases like tumour debulking or foreign body removal where oropharyngeal approach should be the first option. Passing the scope further and leaving the uvula behind, you enter the lower pharyngeal region. The upper border of the epiglottis is the upper limit of the larynx. Passing the epiglottis you can see the artinoid cartilages and muscles and the true and false vocal cords. Always keep the scope centred and remember to spray a topical anaesthetic as you go further in the airway. Then pass the vocal cords into the subglottic region in the upper trachea. In the anterior membrane of the trachea you can see the cartilaginous rings and in the posterior membrane of the trachea you can see the longitudinal elastic fibres. It is easy to navigate and find your position throughout the airway if you have the cartilaginous part of the trachea in the 12 o'clock position. When reaching the distal third of the trachea, you can see the main carina, the right and left main bronchi. The airway inspection can start with the left or with the right bronchus, depending on the case. Going inside the right bronchus, you can see first the upper lobe segments with the apical and the posterior and anterior segments. Anatomical variations of the segments may be noted. 
the bronchus intermedius is noted with the middle, superior and basal bronchi. Inside the middle bronchus, you can see the lateral and medial segments. Then you can see the superior segment of the lower lobe. And then enter the basal segments with the medial basal. The anterior. The lateral. And the posterior segments. Going backwards to the main carina, and then to the left, main bronchus, you can see the upper and lower bronchus. Entering the upper bronchus, you can see the upper division with the epicoposterior. and anterior bronchus. And then with the lingua, with the superior and inferior bronchus. Going to the lower bronchus, you can see the superior segment on the left and then the basal segments anterior or anteromedial, lateral and posterior. Remember to always try and keep the scope in the midline and use suction when needed in order to remove secretions and sample material for analysis. When a full inspection of the airway is completed, perform all necessary interventions depending on the case. Documentation with good pictures and videos of every relevant finding is an important part of the procedure in order to communicate with other physicians and explain the clinical situation. Remove the scope, pulling backwards with caution. Keep the midline. Remember that one can do as much bronchoscopy while removing the scope as one does while advancing it in the first place. Talk to your patient. Make sure that they do not feel any pain, difficulty of breathing or discomfort. Always check for vital signs and oxygen saturation even after the end of the procedure. Take the patient to the recovery area and discuss the findings of the procedure. After one to two hours, if there are no complications noted, they can be discharged home. The final but not least important part of the bronchoscopy procedure is the writing of the report. The report should be complete, well organised and clear. Use pictures to explain your findings.